Hello everyone, my name is Marcella and I am from HANA House in Palo Alto. Welcome to our final virtual business fights of the year. This is a virtual event series hosted by On Its Axis and HANA House. On Its Axis is an innovation consulting firm based in Southern California and HANA House is a flexible co-working space and cafe with locations in Palo Alto and Newport Beach. HANA House offers pay by the hour workspace reservations, which is unique to the co-working world. There is no membership required and can be used by anyone at your own convenience. We are also partnered with Blue Bottle Coffee in our space. If you are in the Bay Area or Orange County, feel free to stop by and check out hanahouse.com to reserve a space and learn more about our seating options, prices, and more. For today's session, I encourage you all to ask questions and use the chat feature. Let's all start off by sharing where you're all tuning in from. As a reminder, this session is being recorded and will be shared on our YouTube channel within the next week. Now I would like to invite our moderator, Kelly, from On Its Access to guide us through today's wonderful panel discussion. Thank you, Marcella. I appreciate that wonderful introduction. And I know I, for one, can hardly believe that this is our final Virtual Business Bites of 2021. So thank you to each and all of the guests who are joining us today and who've joined us throughout the year. Uh, this is an exciting conversation, particularly as we enter into the last, uh, well, as we're in the last two months of uh, 2021 and we're beginning to think about 2022. Um, and thinking about the career path ahead and career tracking. Today's conversation, career tracking, why investing in employee development is a game changer, is actually a conversation point that came up in our study repeatedly from our 2020 Business Bites series, where people are asking about uh, the many ways that people's careers are changing. When we originally envisioned this topic of career tracking, it was really about um, navigating your personal path and aligning your career trajectory to career planning and to your values and the type of organizations you work for. Uh, 2021 introduced a really interesting dynamic to the conversation with the initiation of the conversation point, the great resignation. We've seen tremendous turnover in the marketplace, and we've seen a lot of unexpected pivots from companies and professionals alike. Today, I'm really thrilled to have guest speakers joining us to talk about this important conversation of career tracking and employee development, um, and I'm looking forward to seeing where the conversation takes us. But before I do, uh, just a quick update for everybody who's attending or who's listening in in the future. Our original uh, guest speaker, John Carlson, is unfortunately unable to participate today. Uh, John is uh, unexpectedly not able to be here, but we are incredibly grateful for the last minute jump in of Andy Ryboken, who's joining us today in John's place to talk about this important conversation. So thank you, Andy, uh, Garima, and Brian, all for being here. Um, really excited to hear from you as we move forward. So starting with you, Brian, so we don't put Andy on the spot since he's just jumping in, if you could briefly introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your background and your connection to this topic. Yeah, so uh, first of all, thanks, Kelly. What a, what a great um, forum to present here and a really important topic that we're discussing today. So a little bit about me, I'm, I'm Brian White. I'm an executive life and leadership coach uh, with a focus on uh, leadership development and really kind of cut my teeth early in on the leadership topic. Uh, I joined the Marine Corps Reserves. It was an infantry unit when I was in college. And um, when I achieved my degree, I, was, I got into operations, mostly manufacturing, uh, leadership in the semiconductor industry. And at some point in 2004, I had an opportunity to jump into HR. So I saw it as a really great uh, step for me and, and enhanced my ability to positively influence an entire organization uh, beyond the boundaries of my manufacturing department. Um, rose through the ranks uh, and, uh, you know, fast forward to 2020, 
I'm a, a senior business uh, partner, senior director, uh, strategic business partner in the, in the pharmaceutical research industry, and kind of looking at where I wanted my next third career to go. Uh, I had been pulled to, to coaching, leadership development, and uh, decided to hang out my own shingle, and um, the rest is history. So now I am, I really made it my purpose to help others find their opportunities, develop their, their leadership, and uh, organizations, teams, and, and individuals achieve their, their peak performance and potential. Thanks, Brian. Truly appreciate you being here. Gurima, I'll come to you next. If you could just introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your role and your connection to this topic. Sure. So um, thank you, Kelly, for having and having me as well as Hannah House for inviting us to the forum. Um, Garima Gupta, I've been in HR and the world of HR for 20 plus years, uh, working globally uh, across many countries, many industries. Uh, my current role is as a senior director for the HRBP team, uh, international HR, as well as inclusion at Relativity, which is an e-discovery organization, a global organization based primarily out of Chicago. And uh, my connection to this topic is, well, um, right in the midst of it with talking to managers, executives who are feeling the pain when people are leaving and who are worried about it to say, hey, how do we, what do we do about it? So constantly in uh, regular conversations with my team as well as with leaders in the business to say, what should we be doing proactively um, to be able to kind of, you know, stem the bleeding. Thank you so much, and thank you for being here. Uh, Andy, were you able to join, and are you uh, ready to introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your role and the connection to this topic? Oh, hi, Kelly. Hi, Andy. <laughs> Great hi, to everyone. see you. Sorry, I was, I was just sitting here listening to everyone, and uh, I, I didn't realize I was on mute, and I didn't have my video on, so I was just kind of listening to everyone. Um, so uh, one, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Kelly. I'll, I'll just introduce myself. I'm Andy Riaboken. I'm a systems engineer turned recruiter turned tech advisor, uh, recruiting tech, tech tech advisor. Uh, I work a, a lot in recruiting and retention and advise uh, presidents, CEOs, leaders on how to recruit better and how to retain over uh, over probably in the last 10 years, I think I was mostly in that advisory kind of position. Uh, so that's why I'm kind of tied to the topic. Uh, and a brief history of me, uh, systems engineer, I was a systems engineer at Price Waterhouse, and I built a, a wide area network between LA and New York. And back then, you had, there was no virtual networks, we actually had to, you know, get the wire, the T1 line, and we put, we installed NetWare and Lotus Notes. And that was the first time we started doing shared databases. Uh, later, I built a wide area network or advised on a wide area network in Brazil, Banco Nacional. We connected four major hubs for the fifth largest bank um, in Brazil. And then we connected Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, uh, Belo Horizonte in Brasilia. Uh, that's about 1993. Texas, the tech was just moving way too fast. And uh, a colleague of mine advised me to say, why don't you check out recruiting? And I said, well, you know, recruiting, I can sit there from 50,000 feet and figure out what I'm going to do next. And I ended up staying in recruiting for quite some time. So in 93, I did my first, uh, I did my first search for a programmer. At that time, I was living in Los Angeles. The TV, the media companies were taking their TV and movie content and turning them into games and CD-ROM uh, and a little thing called the internet mobile didn't exist. Uh, so I, you know, I was excited about video phones back in 93. Uh, my first search I did in, in about that time, I placed a programmer uh, and saw my first recruiting check for $25,000. And I think I was 31 years old and that got me hooked in the recruiting business. Uh, kind of fast forward to the early 2000s, I did two big searches. I did a CIO for Capital One and I did the CIO for Avaya. That gave me a calling card to interview any CIO of any finance firm or a calling card to talk to any manufacturing company. That helped me go until about 29, 2010. Then there was a financial collapse. And that's when I met Kelly. Uh, Kelly and I were in the same kind of 
re recruiting class and uh, leadership development. There was about 14 of us that had to go through, a, about 10 of us that went through a 14 week program. It was a long time. So we got trained. Uh, Robert Half did well for me. I, I was, I went to reach for the stars. I was the number one tech recruiter for Robert Half. I was actually, I sat at the, you know, it wasn't a chairman's club, it was a chairman's table. I sat next to Keith Waddell, so I had the whole thing. So that was my thing. Uh, I went in house, I went, then I moved out to Malta. I was running a, a recruiting operation in Malta from Portugal to Ukraine. I speak Portuguese, I'm, my family's Ukrainian, but I was able to work in that, through that sector with about 12 people. And now today I'm, I'm back to kind of the mixture of recruiting operations and how to map technology on top of a proper business process to kind of address, you know, calendar automation, video, voice over IP, interview parsing, how do we optimize candidate experience, employer branding, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and just simplifying your tech stack. So that's kind of where I'm at uh, today. So, and thank you again for having me, Kelly. Well, thank all of you for being here. I am absolutely thrilled. Uh, to have such an incredible panel, and I hope if you're in the audience listening in um, that you appreciate that the panelists aren't just experts in their ability to advise leaders on the topic of employee retention and career planning, but they themselves have gone through the pivot, and this is a really unique uh, panel in that way that we have this global perspective, we have the perspective of, across industries, and we also have the, the perspective of individuals who themselves have taken a career journey um, and flowed through wearing multiple hats uh, throughout their careers. Uh, I'm going to come to you, Garima, first uh, with this next question. I introduced in the opening this idea of the great resignation, um, which for me, um, it is an interesting euphemism, this great resignation. It's about um, the volume of people resigning, but it's also about the motivation um, behind some of the resignations that are taking place. It's definitely a new pivot in very similar way to the financial crisis was a pivot in 2009. Coming to you, can you share your opinion with our audience on the phenomenon of the great resignation, um, why it's happening today, and, and, and really what it is? So uh, I think lots and lots of articles and news is kind of, you know, out there. And I'm sure lots of people are already kind of pulling their hair about, oh, my God, enough about this topic already. But I think one thing that I am listening uh, to my peers as well as, you know, leaders is that um, I think that there's a shift happening in terms of how we work. And this great resignation is an indication of that. A lot of people are calling it the great reshuffle and lo lots of words being thrown away. But I think people are really taking stock of how they have worked up until now and is it how they want to continue to work. Lots of people have options, lots of people have choices and uh, people have had time to you know, reconsider their choices as the pandemic forced us to kind of sit down, think sometimes. And also I think there's a lot of burnout in people. So especially if you see that the largest number of people where resignations are happening massively is in the tech industry as well as the healthcare, right? The two industries which had to really shake up and stand up to be able to help us all being able to work from home and be able to be safe, right? With whether it was the vaccine development or whatever the precautions to be able to continue to work. And that's where the maximum number of resignations are happening because I think people are tired. The burnout is another word that lots and lots of, uh, of us are continuously hearing. So for me, when I am thinking about the great resignation, it is truly understanding what is happening for your employees because what's happening for my company may not exactly be the same with what's happening with somebody else's. And so really understanding, taking stock of what's happening for you and then trying to understand what do you want to do? So for me, it is also... I, I also see that as an opportunity because um, where are these people going? Not everybody's going and standing up a business. They are looking for a better employer, right? They are looking for an employer that cares, that truly will take care of their needs as an employee and truly values them as a human being rather than another cog in the wheel that they have been running. So um, the conversations we are having are absolutely around that to say, what is the voice of the employee? 
and are we listening to it? Because if you're not, then I think this will continue to happen to us as well. Thank you so much. Uh, Andy, I couldn't help but notice you nodding along as uh, Garima was sharing her insights on this. I'll come to you with the same question. Um, can you share with the audience your opinion on this phenomenon of the great resignation? Yeah, uh, so Kelly, you know, I've had a chance to kind of look at, you know, recruiting retention from a lot of different angles, big companies, small companies, where it's big company like Robert Half or, or Price Waterhouse, or if it's a little company like ours, like Honet.ai. There's, there's, it's, I, I agree with the, what we're talking about. I think it's a time for reflection. Okay, and I think there's just been, a, first of all, I'd say it's a great pause before there's been this great this resignation. And I think people really on an individual basis have been able to reflect and look inside and say, what makes me happy? All right. So we, we, we have a common theme on what makes me happy. And today, you know, employees are given a broad range of choices that can make them happy. And again, happiness means a lot of things, a lot of different things for different people. Right. So how do we how do we manage this task? Uh, things got more complicated or more options with you know, office or remote, COVID, no COVID. Politics is everywhere. How do we keep everyone on task, okay? So I think the important, the important thing for organizations, and again, I'm gonna focus on the business leaders. Um, the business leaders must have a compelling reason for me to work for you, okay? Today, the companies I work with today, I ask them in part of their, um, in part of their job description, why should we come for work for your company? And why should we come work for you? You as a business leader, why am I going to trust you and manage my career going forward? So I think there's a lot of a lot of real choices and a lot of people are really reflecting. And I think a lot of people have changed. They've gotten their needs. I'm sorry, their wants in check. OK, as opposed mm -hmm. to their needs. People had, I think, very high demands for their wants. And I think it gave them a time a little time for humbleness. So again, I say, how do we keep them from resigning? You've got to have a compelling business and a compelling leaders to, to keep people on task and focus what's important, which is having a successful business and having a successful career. That's it. Thank you, Andy. Brian, I'm going to come to you with the same question. And I'm going to ask you um, from the perspective of, of an executive coach. As, as you're talking with people who are considering making a change, um, do you have any unique sort of perspective on the great resignation from the side of the employee narrative? Yeah, and that's probably one of the perils of going third in the questions, right? So Karima and, and Andy, I mean, total, totally nailed it, right? So uh, I agree, I, I characterize this as kind of uh, the result of the great pause. So. We, we shut down the world, we shut down business, we paused um, where and how we do work and it gave people a chance to really reflect on, on their values and what was important to them, what is important to them. Um, and my experience has, has shown me that people really wanna be rewarded for doing meaningful work, right? And we can't all solve a CSI episode or solve a crime at the end of the episode and so, uh, you know, it, it becomes what is meaningful to me. Um, and, you know, the, the panelists and, and the, the viewers may have heard uh, the old Witham statement, right? What's in it for me? I think that from an employee perspective, people are starting to um, look at what's in it for them. What are they asked to do? What are they asked to sacrifice uh, for companies, for organizations, for their leaders? And how does that align with their personal values uh, their personal goals and what's really important to them. So it's a um, it's a complete reassessment of what our what our values and goals are um, in terms of our careers. Very important. Thank you, Brian. I think as as we think about this, Andy, you I'm going to come to you first because you mentioned that you've had the unique experience of working with large organizations, small organizations, mature organizations and startups. Um, and in wearing that hat and, and seeing that frame, 
I'd love to hear your perspective on what role companies and the leaders within those companies play in reducing that employee turnover, because I believe you started to talk about that in your last response. Yeah, uh, true, Kelly. And I, again, I've seen it in, in big companies, how, how that reward system works for a big company, again, like Robert Half, or how it works for a, a small company. I was VP of people for a company called B-Spot that was in the internet gambling business of all things. So I was had that kind of experience. But it, it breaks down to two things to me, straightforward, recognitions and rewards. And I'll kind of be direct on these things. Rewards, I have found, are generally three things, food, time, or money. And I suggest the following, you know, food, don't make it just a Starbucks card, you know, make it something substantial that they could enjoy. Time at a vacation day, you know, you, we have, we give you a vacation day or a vacation extra a couple of days, not just tomorrow off, but you plan it when you want it like that. And then money. If your business and you're in business, you're voted, you're voted, motivated by money. And, and a couple other things that I think are important here. You know, I don't like retreats. I don't like company retreats and I don't like parties on company time. If you're going to take care of your employees, take care of them on company time. And it's really important because I've been in a couple of company parties where I've had a, you know, a colleague say, what am I doing here, man? I, I got to drive all the way back to the Valley. I see you guys eight hours a day. I see, why am I here? Upset. You know, so I, I, you know, and we're supposed to be joyous and, and we're, we're, we're force feeding this thing. So important to take care of business on business time. Number one, and then the last thing, number one reason people leave is the relationship with their boss. End of story. Number one, you know, if either the business fails because it's a bad boss or the relationship with the boss or the boss changes. So be a good boss. So if you want to be a re reduce your risk of losing employees, listen to your employees. Everyone should be having one-on-ones with their, with their leadership team, with their staff to, to listen, to listen to what's going on in the field. Okay. If you're a good manager, if you're a good leader, and I like the, I like the GE approach. I like the general electric approach. I kind of, we, we always kind of, kind of started broadly. So what's going well, you know, I'm hitting my coding deadlines, all that stuff's going well. Okay. What needs improvement? Where can we, what's, what's, what's not working for you? And then you get into these what why questions, really important. Why are you feeling this way? And this will then give you a way to listen and then take action as immediately as close to the, I want to call it an incident, but the, 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 the revelation and reactive on it. That's how you, that's how you keep them in, in today's world. So recognition and rewards. And if you're doing it, you know, just some little things, even a shout out. You know, I, 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 you know, I, I share an office with my wife and she gives a shout out. She's all, you know, she's all like this. So really that open recognition and, and gives people some time, food or money. Back to you, Kelly. Thanks, Andy. Uh, Brian, I'll come to you second this time and uh, ask for you to weigh in on the same topic. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, great. Um, I love this question. And, um, and, you know, what Andy described there towards the end was really a, a coaching, uh, coaching culture um, within an organization, right? And um, if we, if we accept that, that people leave managers, they don't leave companies, then how important is that direct manager role? It is supremely important. And I always like to go back to um, Google's project Oxygen, where they really um, using people analytics and data um, throughout the Google organization, they defined what made a good manager at Google. And, and certainly there was a there was a technical track, and then there was a more global uh, slash you know administrative track. But isn't it interesting that of the original eight qualities that were identified as a good manager at Google? Uh, the, the technical aspect of being a, you know, having the technical knowledge for the role didn't appear until number eight, right? So what is number one? The leader is a coach. So when you can create and instill, implement a coaching culture within the organization, it's a lot of the things that Andy mentioned. It's asking those deeper questions. It's... Um, uh, asking, you know, instead of telling the employee what to do, it's what roadblocks are you facing and how can I be a resource to you? So 
Um, we're talking about identifying, you know, certainly this was a this was a Google project, but in order to really stem the tide of this or to create a coaching culture, you have to understand what makes your organization tick, uh, what is important to your employees. And then you get the, the, the buy-in and you get specific actions that you can then implement in terms of uh, active leadership development programs and uh, applying those. So we're talking about number one, always. And, and by the way, this study has been redone. It's evolving over time. And they've added a couple to the end. Number one is still the leader as a coach. And, and follow that are the soft skills, good, good communicator, um, empowers employees, is not a micromanager, uh, shows concern. And, here, and here's where they, they renamed this when they added uh, additional, uh, from additional feedback, is concerned about employee psychological safety and well being. So, this is kind of the first year that we start. Um, pulling in a little bit of the, the DEI um, into how we lead within an organization. So number one, um, you know what what can um, uh, companies and and leadership do? Install a coaching culture. Teach your managers how to lead differently uh, because the expectations have changed. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, Grima, I'm putting you in the, the challenging third seat this time. Um, we heard Andy talk about rewards and recognition, and Brian talk about uh, developing a, cult, a coaching culture within organizations. What role do you believe companies and leaders play in reducing employee turnover? Yeah, I, I think I fully endorse what Andy and Brian said. I'm a huge fan of the coach approach. Um, in the organization for managers to kind of learn the coaching skills to be able to manage the people. But I think also kind of the shift in culture that leaders need to realize is not everything is going to continue as a top-down approach, which is how we've always kind of done the business. The other thing is that we were always very business-focused, where productivity, efficiency, these were the conversations around the table. I think the conversation is going to change. One, you do need to understand the bottoms up. I, I think Andy was mentioning, you do need to understand what your employees are saying, uh, listen to the people's voice. And the other thing is that you need to have the human centric approach to the business, right? All of this conversation around rewards and recognition, treating your employee as a coachee, as a mentee, I think it centers around recognizing that these are not you know, employee ID X, Y, Z, but these are humans and uh, the pandemic has forced us to bring our homes into the office and the office into our homes. And so, you know, as boundaries have crossed, we've realized more and more managers, more and more leaders have realized that there's a real human being in that title of finance controller or, you know, whatever that might be. And so how do you really make space to be able to have those real human conversations? Because you're not in the office, you're not having those uh, water cooler conversation where you get to read a little bit of the body language, where you get to know something's not well, because we all are going from Zoom to Zoom. And so people making time deliberately, intentionally uh, keeping space to know each other as human beings is going to be paramount. So that word empathy, which I think Brian was kind of referring to, I think it's going to be key. You can't, those are the leaders who are going to continue to lose their talent, their top potential talented people who refuse to come to the fold of this. So as a leader, as a manager, if you're not paying attention to what is happening for people on your team, if you're not paying attention to what is happening in their day-to-day -day lives and not listening to them, not making space to listen, I think it's not going to uh, kind of cut it. And I also think that one of the most important things that leaders need to develop, which I feel a lot of us have lost it, is being able to listen. We all like to talk a lot, but we are not good listeners. Often what happens in Zoom calls I've seen is that instead of thinking about or listening to what the other person is saying, we are so busy either checking our phone or the next tab that's open on a computer or thinking about, oh, what should my answer be to that question that the person has asked? or you know, there, there are enough distractions that we are not really truly listening. We may be hearing it, but we are not listening. And 
this is a game of listening because it's if it is easy to miss it out when we are in the same room, believe me, it is so, so, so much easier to miss it out when we are all kind of jumping in the 30 minute meeting. OK, right. Come on, let's do it. And then we jump to the other meeting and jump to the other meeting. And then the day is over and then the, you know, the home uh, business starts where you have to cook and the cleaning and all of that. So I think making space for that listening is for me, as far as I'm a manager too, I've got reports, direct reports, whom I take care of, who are sitting in many parts of the world. If I don't make time to listen to them, I don't think I'm doing justice as a leader. Thank you. I think this is such a powerful point that we're talking about here, the, the genuine concern, right? This authentic concern with the employee experience, the what's in it for them experience, this genuine idea of active listening, um, I think is a really foundational element that we for many years took for granted. And I can't help but come back to this pause, this idea of the pause um, as creating space to reinvent how we engage with one another, not just from tools like Zoom, but, but also in the ways in which we engage and develop ourselves and each other within the workforce. Um, Andy shared an example uh, in his genuine introduction. Uh, he and I both participated in a leadership development program, um, which is an incredible example of an opportunity of an employee skill development. I think we're entering into a new phase of what these look like. And Brian, um, coming to you, I'll ask for you to share an example of an employee skill development or a career tracking program that you believe has been successful in helping an organization develop and retain talent. And I'd love to hear specifically, as you, as you think about these types of programs, um, what you believe makes it uniquely successful or sets it up for success. Yeah, thank you, Kelly. And, and just, to, just to kind of put a bookend of what Karima said, I love the old Samuel Clemens quote, you know, we were given um, two ears and one mouth, uh, use them proportionally, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, let me, I wanted to share now the, the jury is out on this one, but, but as I, as I examined, um, this example, I see so much potential and it really represents kind of a broader scope of thinking. So, um, I can tell you that, um, uh, Amazon, uh, this is a specific company, obviously, but Amazon has, uh, is now working with a partner to provide educational opportunities for uh, their employees to participate in a programming boot camp, right? So it's, it's a it's paid education. Um, now, certainly Amazon's business is all about, you know, algorithms, decisions, programming. I mean, they're, they make their, their living uh, on the web. And so there is a business need there, but they've also identified through employee surveys that a lot of their younger employee population are, are very invested in the tech world. They have interest um, and they're certainly consumers of, uh, of the programming environment in terms of websites and how, how we do um, online commerce and things like that. So uh, the very interesting part is, is here is that success is, is defined as the employee uh, accepting a job in that in that role so as a software engineer and it doesn't matter whether they find a job within amazon or if they find a job outside of the organization between that partnership that is the success measure is them completing the program and finding a role and so i think the implication is um you know in the not that long ago i used to say that there were two kinds of organizations there, there was one that, um, that it was very important for them to hold on to their employees as long as they, they can, uh, train them and keep them. And then the other, on the other side of the spectrum is the organization, the business that understands that their business model, they're gonna have a high turnover rate. And so they need to train and develop their employees as quickly as possible um, so that they can have the most impact for, the, for their stay, right? So for for the uh, duration of their employment, as short as that may be. I don't think that's true anymore. I think that, that organizations are starting to, um, I, I hope, 
kind of adopt a little bit higher level of social consciousness and understand that if they provide opportunities for employees to continue to develop in, an, in, a, in a path, a career path that interests them, um, they, are, they are creating a greater good. And it's a, it's a, it's a, a brand ambassadorship um, it shows investment and development in their employees. And the kicker is that it's a success whether you work for us or not. So I think that, um, and I hope that, that organizations are starting to see that they're not just there to make money and uh, increase their power in the marketplace, that they are actually contributing to society in different ways in terms of, in terms of educating and developing a workforce that more and more in this world uh, requires uh, a, a technical a technical background or um, identity. Thank you, Brian. Garima, coming to you this time. Hi. Right, so, um, I mean, again, I uh, would like to build on what Brian said. So, agree with you know what uh, it, it's a little bit of customization to what your employees are needing. And not everybody is at the same career stage, life stage, or uh, aspiration stage. So different people are at different places. So to be able to kind of, you know, do something for each of them in a way that they want is kind of where this uh, whole upskilling, reskilling your employees is happening, right? It, it's no longer good enough to retain them how are you preparing them for whatever is coming in the future? And then the future is um, complicated, and not stable, changing continuously. So how do you prepare them to be resilient in the face of challenge and change and to be able to kind of, you know, own their career? That's a little bit of the mantra that we are using. I definitely can um, narrate two uh, initiatives that I've worked on uh, in different organizations. One of them was kind of, you know, uh, building uh, cohorts of managers because oftentimes, and I think about Brian and Andy were referring to managers playing a big role, is that often people are put in those manager roles because they were very good at something that they were doing. And now it's like, oh, you're good at that, now promote you, become a manager. But most organizations do not really do the handholding once you are a manager to say, how do you become a manager? Because these days the demands are for manager are you need to be a wellness expert. You need to be able to provide psychological safety. You need to be able to have performance conversations. You need to be able to have career development conversations. You need to be able to recruit great people. Like, I mean, come on, the, the asks of a manager are becoming more and more every day without truly organizations providing them with, okay, you'll have like a manager one-on-one and then that's it. Like, you know, okay, go, go do it. So I think, uh, investing in your middle level frontline managers is very, very crucial because they are holding the key to your employee experience. And if you're all talking about employee experience, while you and I sitting in our HR seats, we are building an initiative, but ultimately it is them who are actually having those conversations, who are actually making sure that this is happening and this is being done right. So I, um, we used to do these things called management mornings, management afternoons, where we develop these cohorts of people and one of the members, they, they selected the topics that they wanted to hear. And they also kind of gave us voting on the people who they think did really well on something like that, right? So let's say it was budget management. And they said, you know what, Brian uh, on that team is excellent. He, every time he shares this, his team meetings, they're great. Or, you know, Andy runs a great team meeting. Every time he, there's an agenda, there's this, we would love to learn from Andy. And so they would select, we as the HR team would help them understand how to run uh, or how to facilitate the session and they would run it. They ran the session. And the beauty of this is that while Garima and Kelly being in HR may not speak the business speak, Andy and Brian being parts of the business, they spoke the language that these people would understand or connect to better. And so the cohort members felt it easier to put raise their hand up and say, hey, Andy, how, how do you do this? Or what about that challenge? And also building the cohort was kind of this community of leaders who were coming together and saying, oh, this is not just my problem, but Brian experiences this too. And Andy, even being so senior, he, he's experienced that trouble too. So, you know, being that vulnerable, 
uh, empathetic leader showing it those words. So that uh, was very low cost. I've run it in multiple nonprofits where I didn't have like large budgets and it was um, very successful. Done it on a global scale as well. And um, I think any organization can stand up because you do have internal faculty. You do have internal expertise where you always don't need to go outside. Um, the other thing I would say is making space for learning because one of the biggest pieces that you know that or your high potential talent or your high talent is often uh, being thrown lots of big challenges on. They're the ones who are often feeling the burnout. So how do you make space for them? And they're the ones who want to learn, who are curious to learn more. How do you make space on their calendars to get some learning done? So I think when learning is woven into the day-to-day -day and it is related to the job, on the job learning, I think truly learning happens then. So I have been part of an organization where, you know, it was almost like this opportunity marketplace where you can put your hand up and say, you know, these projects going on, I could really give 10% of my time there. And because I really want to learn how strategy is written or how strategy is implemented. And I get to go and learn from there instead of me sitting in a classroom where, you know, after a little while, something is getting in my brain or something is not, but being part of something that's really going to implement in the business that I'm going to see the results of being part of this team of people who are all kind of working towards the same goal suddenly the learning in that kind of an environment was a different kind, a different stage of learning as compared to sitting down in a classroom. And then the third, I'm a huge fan of coaching. I think coaching is an excellent way for managers, for leaders to be able to get the answers within the individual, right? Because a lot of us hold the key to where do we want to go? What do we want to become? Where is our next step? Sometimes we don't know how to get there. And a good coach and hopefully Brian, you can endorse that, is able to help you get those answers which are sitting deep inside within you. So those are the three that I would suggest from personal experience. I have been a huge fan of coaching myself. I think it uh, kind of changed my life, but sitting with a good coach. So uh, those are kind of some of my recommendation or experiences. Thank you, Karima. Um, Andy, I'm gonna to come to you with this one uh, and specifically, asking you to talk about um, a program that you've seen be successful in helping an organization with uh, employee development. So we talked about retention and we heard both Brian and Grima talk about maybe retention is less important um, in today's world. And so I'll, I'll make the slight adjustment and ask about skill development with this goal of employee development. Right, right. Well, first, I completely agree with Garima and, and Brian about leaders need to be support leaders, number one. Uh, I, I sat at a table with Jack Welsh at a, at, a, at a conference that we were sponsoring, and he told us in his speech, he talked about, you know, I don't build the airplane. I just hire the engineers who build the engine. So I need to listen to what my team needs to build up, to do what they do. So I need to manage the people. So listen, listen to the people, very important. Um, the, the things I think that are important in, in, in skill development, particularly for the employee, I think one, you, it, it is what's in it for me and you, you gotta show success and be successful early. Be successful early and often. And, I, and I'll, I'll talk about a couple of things here. One. Uh, I think one of the better training programs that I've been on, and again, I've been in, in large insurance companies, uh, large accounting firms, uh, large recruiting firms. And the one I'm going to re reach to most is, is my experience with Robert Half. And I, I think it's important for, for a variety of reasons. What I appreciated about Robert Half was kind of the following. One, they have an enormous curriculum for leadership development. I mean, as a division director or as a branch manager or, or a regional leader, you are continuously being trained on, on everything you could possibly imagine, you know. So it was continually developing the, and these skills and just re, re, it, and building myself as a leader. So this was very important, important stuff for, for me as a development. But they had a great curriculum. And then I'll tell you again, it came down to a, a, a good support leader. I had a very good 
uh, president of our, our, of our region at Robert Half, his name was Craig Capper. And he took a, a personal interest in me being successful at the company. And I'll tell you why. So, you know, Kelly and I, we've gone through very similar, this regimen of training. I went through it for three years and I was able to develop my career from a division director to a branch manager. I, I did perm, I did a temp, and then I got into executive search. And all this was because I had a good leader who helped me guide my way through this kind of large organization. And I'll, and I'll back to the coaching, because I think it's definitely a coaching relationship today. It's no more do this or you're, you know, you're gone. You know, it's not, you know, it's, it's not Hollywood, you know, do it, do it my way or you'll never work in this town again. Um, but it took this, this person who, who, who is specifically looking out for my success. And I'll tell you, after one of these leadership meetings, I was in a business situation. And I'll tell you, we had a, we had a company in downtown LA and we had a good number of their people on our payroll. So if it was about a 300 person organization, 200, 200 of those employees were on a Robert Half pay, payroll and it was my responsibility. So the invoice came in and um, it was about, for the first month, I believe it was about $72,000. And the, uh, the, the wire didn't come through. Okay. So I, I sit there, I, I call my, 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 my leader. I said, no wire. He goes, Andy, I want you to do this. Why don't you go buy two cups of coffee? I, mean, you watch, I want you to go walk into that office and sit there and have two cups of coffee and come back with a payment. I was like, okay, so this is, this is now all that training goes to work. So that's what I did. And I, I walked to the door. I, I told him I was here for the, for the particular business leader. I was here with coffee. I waited and I said, Sam, you got to pay the bill. Ah, we're not paying the bill right now. No, Sam, we're paying the bill today. <laughs> okay. And what I learned is, is through, through a relationship with this particular instance, again, this has got me well promoted because I was able to ha skillfully handle this type of situation. We got paid that day. And not only, and only later did I find, probably about a year later, maybe, maybe probably about two years later, did I find that of, you know, Robert Half was a service provider, K-Force was a service provider, someone else was a service provider. We were the only ones who got paid. These, all these other companies got stuck with enormous bills because they were an unsuccessful internet startup that only had money to pay us to keep the things rolling. So it's important to have good leadership, put your, put, put your people in a pl place to be successful and they're successful, you support them. If they're not, you know, they, they get released back into industry. So that's the best I can offer on this, on this uh, 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 topic, Kelly. Uh, thank you, Andy. I, I love this story because I think it really is a bookmark example of um, what each of you alluded to but didn't come out and say, which is that this, this listening, this engagement with the employee experience is about developing mutual trust. Andy, in that situation, you were willing to step out of your comfort zone because you trusted the guidance you had, because you trusted that your leader saw in you the potential to do something. And that's what that coaching relationship creates. It creates um, a self-trust, a self-awareness, Garima, as you were saying, that you're finding from within yourself what your kind of true north is, what, what the principle you're, you're looking toward is. Um, and I think great leaders today are creating psychological safety by listening, by um, creating a space for trust. And, and that does create retention. It creates great relationships. Um, and, it, and it creates confident employees and confident employees perform and, and they perform in outstanding ways. And so thank you for, for, for that capstone. As they, as they move us through the conversation um, the, the next talking point we were asking was uh, for a piece of advice. And so I'm going to ask each of you um, now to think about this question, uh, a piece of advice that you'd share with leaders who are concerned about either the rising quits rates or this change that's taking place, the, the sort of future unknown that's upcoming. But I'm not going to ask you to answer it yet. I'm going to give us an opportunity for each of you to reflect on this one, to think about this piece of advice. And that's where I'll ask in a minute 
for your closing thoughts. I'd, I'd like you to give your advice as a closing thought. But now I'd love to come to our audience and I'll give our audience the opportunity in the chat to be able to ask some questions of our panelists before we conclude our time together today. Um, so if you've been listening in live and you have a question for our panel, whether you're joining in from East Africa or Armenia or San Francisco, um, or if you're here from Spring, Texas, if you have a question for our panel um, from Oakland, California, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, so uh, please drop it in the chat. And uh, thank you to those of you who've asked me up front um, one, one question that has come in uh, to us uh, through today's conversation that I'll ask each of you, and feel free for any of you to, to chime in on this one, is around the topic of employee development. And so um, as an employee, uh, if you want to change your role within the organization, but you don't know how to bring that up to your manager. How would you advise an employee who wants to change, wants to develop, but doesn't see the career path in their organization? Do, do any of you have advice for that person, that employee who wants to make a career change, um, but doesn't know how to create that conversation? Kelly, happy to go Graham, on. I see HR. you went off with Mike. Yeah. HR business partner, this is what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, right? They, these are the kind of questions that often come to us. So my advice would be that um, if you don't feel sure of reaching out to your direct manager immediately, go get some help. If you have a mentor or a sponsor, a coach, they are good people to get some advice on. But otherwise, your HR business partners or your HR connect may be good people to talk to as well to say, what are my options? Uh, often these days, companies are investing a lot in internal talent mobility to make sure that they are retaining staff and that talent is, isn't going out. So I think making a start is always a good point. In fact, just yesterday, I was talking to one of our execs where we were talking about that, you know, our product team often takes people from engineering and vice versa. And so how do we kind of create like a pathway which people can see, right? Uh, the word jungle gym has been thrown about to say, Careers are no longer just kind of moving, you know, in a particular way, but you need to kind of think about, you need to have this experience and this experience and this different kinds of experience before you can, you know, become an exec or a senior leader. So I think um, you need to figure out a way to test it out with some people if you don't feel comfortable. Or if you do have a good relationship with your manager, I would say, go and say that, hey, this is what I'm looking for in my career. I would uh, love to get your advice. How can you help me develop? You would be surprised that sometimes managers, even though, yes, they don't want to lose their talent, they also know that rather than holding on tight to the talent, if they have good conversations, if they can show them the path, the likelihood of that employee being with their team, being with the organization is higher, um, and they might surprise you. So I would say take, take the avenue which works out for you um, because it would be different in different cases. Right. Um, before I ask for either of you to weigh in, and I see, Brian, you're ready to go. I'm going to come to you in one second. There's this additional question. Um, are there any resources on the topic of make learning part of the day-to-day? -day? If you can find a way to incorporate um, an answer to that as we're thinking about and adding into this conversation of how do I – how do I make a career change? Um, Brian, I'll come to you with, with both of those questions now. Great, okay, so a little curveball there, but that's perfect. Um, so, I, I, you know, I wanted to say that as, as Karima mentioned, you know, the old structure was that we had a career ladder, a, a, a set in stone career path. You were a doer and then you, you, had a, you went left to management or you went right to some sort of subject matter expert. And I think that, more and more companies are are seeing that it's really more of a career lattice, right? So similar to the jungle gym, where you have all these different handholds that you can you can move to in a career lattice type structure, um, you can you can take a step to the left, you can take a step to the right, but you're gaining skills um, as you go, and it still is contributing to your personal and professional development as you progress within the organization. So um, 
how do you incorporate the, the learning into day to day and how do you approach a manager when you have an interest in a career change? Kareem, I think you mentioned this. It's, it's about demonstration. So uh, my advice to, to an individual in that, in that situation, if they're, they're considering uh, a, a step to the left is find a stretch project, find um, something that applies to the career direction that they're looking for and volunteer for that opportunity. Make a name for yourself, uh, let's say from an enterprise-wide perspective and the organization will see you as enterprise-wide talent. And, and I believe personally that the opportunities will, uh, will, we make our own opportunities, but when we can demonstrate that we're growing and we can contribute outside of our zone of, of control, um, then the organization is much more willing to give us a chance to operate um, in another zone. Did that answer the question? Wonderful. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank okay. you for, for taking on the curveball, um, knocking it out of the park. Um, I want to come back to this question that's on the screen now uh, as we wrap up our time. Um, I'll come to you first, Andy, on this one, and I'm going to ask for you to provide one piece of advice that you'd share with a leader, um, particularly as it relates to rising quits rates or employee development? Right. Uh, again, I've, I've been in the face of this throughout my career of, of just, you know, people wanting to quit, not being happy, whether there's a, a epidemic of it going on now, people wanting to quit. Um, I think you touched on, and I think all of our, our speakers touched on this today, is about, is about one, uh, it's listening, okay? And with listening, you can start develop, developing trust. And again, I, I think it comes to good leadership, but if you're gonna give, if I'm gonna give a business manager out there, the one piece of advice is, is listen and again, build trust. And again, we do it today at Honed AI, we try to build trust between recruiting managers and hiring executives. You know, we, we interview the candidate, now trust me to tell you to hire this guy. You know, what we do is just, uh, take the take the element of trust out. We just provide the recorded interview, a highlight of it and say, listen to the interview. I'm not selling this guy to you. I don't think he's great anymore. But this is where that trust comes in. And the we've been finding that trust with the recruiters between their hiring managers is what's central to them being successful. And, and I'll tell you why. The hiring managers now- and Andy, I'm sorry. I Andy, I'm going to pause you for just a second, just where I want to be honoring everybody's time and everybody's volunteering to be here. I think that's a great, that's a great capstone is listening and trust. Uh, Garima, coming to you just um, very succinctly in this expert advice, you get one liner, um, a, a final, a final note of trust. So I'm going to use uh, Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft. He said it. Instead of the know it all, it is the learn it all who are going to rule the roost. So that's what I would say mm. that recruit the learn it all and encourage the learn it all because that's what we are talking about. I think that will help you with all of these questions that we were talking about. Beautiful quote. Brian, coming to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I believe that the greatest skill for future generations is to be able to learn, unlearn, and learn again. And that applies to leadership as well, right? We, we may learn a certain style of leadership, something that, that applies in the present, but we have to be adaptable. We have to continually evolve as leaders. We have to um, ask ourselves the deeper, tougher questions of what our motivations are. And more and more, I found that, that leadership is all about um, finding shared values and building a community and then rolling up the sleeves, right? Hard, hard times build, build loyalty. And when you're willing to sacrifice in whatever situation for your employees, um, that builds that trust and that community and will ensure success. Thank you so much, Brian, Garima, and Andy. As always, uh, your contributions are so valuable, and I wish we could spend another half an hour here um, talking through this very important topic, but um, what you shared is, is really incredible, and I know it's going to help other people. 
um, as they lead and as they learn in the world. So thank you. Uh, Marcella, I'll turn it back to you to conclude our session today. Thank you, Kelly. And thank you to our panelists, Ryan, Garima, and Andy for taking the time to share your insight and expertise with us today. This was an amazing and valuable session on employee engagement and relationships within the workplace. I will be sending a feedback survey into the chat box and please take this moment to let us know how we can improve our future sessions. And thank you all for joining us today. Wishing you all happy and healthy holidays as we look forward to seeing you in 2022. Enjoy the rest of your day.